Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in our special series, The Life of David, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 11. Now, before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins to God, and we're allowing His Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and all that you have provided. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're coming to the end of David's life and our study. We left last time in the middle of David's son, Adonijah, trying to seize the throne from David and at the same time would not allow Solomon to become king. Remember, Adonijah had drummed up support from Joab, David's general, Abiathar the priest, but Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, the head of David's bodyguard, remained loyal to David. So we have uh, different groups on different sides. Adonijah was doing what kings do to claim the throne. He wanted to seize it from David. He got the chariot with horses and 50 runners, remember that. Then he threw a festival at En Rogal with many sacrifices. He invited his brothers, the king's son, the king's officials of Judah. It's not confirmed whether they actually attended, but he would not invite Nathan the prophet or Benaiah, the one in charge of David's bodyguard, wouldn't expect that either, or the mighty men who fought with David or his own brother Solomon, of course, who was supposed to be the next king. Well, Nathan the prophet had heard about Adonijah's coup, his attempted takeover, and talked to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. Verse 11, Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and David our lord, does not know it. Now, Bathsheba would be the quickest way to get the word to David. After all, she is the mother of Solomon, who's supposed to be the next king. She's been told he's going to be the next king. She was also the favorite wife of David. So Nathan is going to get her help to get David to do something about Adonijah. Verse 12, so Nathan's still talking to Bathsheba. Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Now, what's he talking about here? Saving her life and Solomon's life. Because if Adonijah became king, he would probably have them killed. He didn't want any opposition to the throne. So Nathan presents to Bathsheba his advice and plan. Here's what he tells her, verse 13. Go in at once to King David and say to him, Do you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant? Did you not, my lord the king, swear to your servant, talking about herself, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Now let me remind you, Nathan is telling Bathsheba what to say to David. He's supposed to, uh, she's supposed to go in at once, first of all, then question David. Did you not, my lord, the king, talking to David, swear to your servant, speaking of her, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me. So she is going to remind David that he told her he's the next king. Then she ends up this question, why then is Adonijah king? Now, he didn't know this, but this is the way Nathan wants her to present it to him. This is a way of informing David, telling him for the first time that Adonijah has claimed the throne. It's like, how could this get past you, David? So this alerts David that he has not been aware of what's going on in his kingdom, in particular his son Adonijah. 
So Nathan is giving Bathsheba this advice and instruction. So how we're going to break the news to David, what Adonijah is doing. He gives him a, they want to give him a one, two punch. First Bathsheba will go in. And then at a certain point, Nathan will go in to David. He continues the plan. Then while you are still speaking there with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. Now, Let's understand, it's not a question of whether Solomon's supposed to be king. It's that if David does not act, Adonijah will get so established and the people will start backing him that they won't be able to get Adonijah out. And then he'll wipe away, away he'll wipe out any opposition, namely Bathsheba and Solomon. So it's important for David to act now. That's where they're going to do this one two punch. All right, so they got the plan. Now it goes into play, verse 15. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. That would be like his bedroom. Then it notes here in a paragraph, in a parenthesis rather, now the king was very old, Abishai, and Abishag the Shumanite was attending to the king. Remember, she's the beautiful young woman who's the bed warmer to help keep him from being cold. Now David's pretty old now. But he's also a, a feeble, decrepit, not be able to keep his temperature right in his body. So he's got some physical problems. And this reminds us how old David is and his condition. She goes in there and there's Abishag taking care of the king. Bathsheba begins by offering the traditional greetings to David, who is the king still. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king, and the king asked, what do you want? That's verse 16. Verse 17, she said to him, My Lord, you swore to your servant, talking about herself, by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on the throne. So she reminds David what you, you told us, David, that he would be the next king. She reminds David of his promise to make her son the next king. Then she tells King David something new. And now, behold, Adonijah is king, and now, my lord, the king, you did not know. She fills David in on what Adonijah has done, and the fact that this was done behind his back without him knowing it. Something failed here. Even the attempt by someone to do this, David should have known about it. But remember, he's not up to his best anymore. He's old. He probably doesn't hear that well. And people aren't uh, giving him the information so he can make decisions like he used to. So she goes on. Verse 19. He has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army. But Solomon, your servant, he has not invited. So in doing this, Adonijah has done some major steps in establishing himself as king. He's doing his takeover. Verse 20. And now, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. So here's the deal. Bathsheba says the whole country, the whole nation, is waiting to see if David will confirm Adonijah as king. Or has someone else anointed? Because you see, the people wanted to hear what David had to say before they made their decision. And David hadn't decided. But he's still alive. So as long as he's alive and can talk and can think, they expect David to confirm who the next king is. It's up to King David now as to what he's going to do. Verse 21. This is Bathsheba continuing to talk to David. Otherwise, it'll come to pass when my lord the king sleeps with his fathers, that's a way of saying when you die, that I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. So Bathsheba tells David that if he does not act now, that both 
Solomon and herself will be treated as criminals and their lives will be forfeited. In other words, they'll be killed because Adonijah wouldn't have any opposition. So David is another reason to act urgently. Now, here comes the second punch. Remember, Nathan's going to come in. When she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. Verse 23. And they told the king, this is the servants announced to the king, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Now it's Nathan's turn to act, to confirm and back up what Bathsheba has told the king. Verse 24, And Nathan said, My lord the king, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me? and he shall sit on my throne. So like Bathsheba, Nathan reminds David of his promise. Says a little bit different. Make him think a little bit more about what's, being go- what's been going on. Verse 25. Nathan continues. For he has gone down this day and has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they are eating and drinking before him and saying, Long live King Adonijah. So Nathan gives gives some more details that Bathsheba didn't say. He says, Now they're saying, Long live King Adonijah. And this has gone on. He's even doing the sacrifices. He's invited a bunch of high-ranking people of Israel to the festival. This is happening right now, David, which emphasizes the urgency. This needs to get done now, David. So Nathan the prophet confirms all that Bathsheba has just said and more. He's already doing the sacrifices and is being announced as king. Nathan continues talking to David. He says, But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your son Solomon, he was not invited. So he tells David that Anijah has intentionally not invited these people, Zadok, Benaiah, head of the bodyguard, and of course, Solomon. Now, let's talk about the bodyguard for a moment. And you probably know this. If the United States, United States has, our president has secret service who protect him. They guard him. In the ancient world, the king had his own bodyguard. We've talked about this already with David. He actually had mercenaries, men who had no political affiliations and would not easily be one to any person in Israel. But their loyalty was to David. He had led them. They knew he was a reputable warrior over the years. So they play an important role of of protecting David and the throne, preventing any harm coming to David. And Adonijah's method, like Absalom, was to go around the king and not confront him directly or get involved with his most loyal people or have him murdered as often happened in the ancient world. That just wouldn't work at this point. David had been too popular with the people. Anyway, Adonijah was sure not going to invite the bodyguard or David's elite soldiers who had been loyal to David for so long. Verse 27. Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king? Now, this is interesting the way Nathan puts this. Has this thing been brought about, talking about Adonijah's takeover, been brought about by my lord the king? And have you not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So what Nathan's saying, he's saying, David, this has happened because you hadn't appointed a king. Adonijah moved in. And because of your inaction in in announcing who should be the next king, Adonijah is taking advantage of it. So what is missing here is the step in confirming who the next king will be before all the people. 
after Nathan speaks, David responds quickly. Then David answered, call Bathsheba to me. So we didn't know this, but she had been out, out outside the room. So he calls her back in. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore, saying, as the Lord lives, who has rescued me out of every diversity, he reminds us of the Lord and what he's done for David. He's taking care of him in so many situations. Verse 30, he's rescued me from out of every adversity. Verse 30, as I swore to you by the Lord, the King of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so will I do this day. So he's saying, he's swearing by the Lord who's rescued him. So this is swearing by the Lord, a solemn oath, that just as the Lord has taken care of me, I have also swore to you that Solomon, your son, shall reign after me. And it's in effect this day. Even so, I will do this day. So what David's going to do, he's going to follow through this time and make sure everything is done to put Solomon on the throne. He's going to do it today. Verse 31. Then Bathsheba boweth her face to the ground and paid homage, respect to the king, and said, May my lord King David live forever. This is a way of saying, May God keep you alive and bless you. And this is a, a traditional greeting to approve of the king. Verse 32. King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. Remember, he's the head of the bodyguard. So they came before the king. So he calls out these three men to carry out the public anointing of Solomon. Verse 33. And the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gilhom. The servants here are the um, elite soldiers, the bodyguard. So all these men with the bodyguard are going to go down to Gihon. So Solomon's protected. They're going to do the official anointing of Solomon. Now, why did he have him ride his mule? Because David's mule, well, the fact that it was David's, and it was given over to Solomon, shows the people, hey, he's on David's mule, and shows that David's approving of this. And they know David is bedridden back probably in bed in Jerusalem, but he's on his mule, and he wouldn't be able to sit on his mule unless David said so. So they understand that Solomon had David's blessing. Now, they sent him down to Gihon. Now, this is where they usually did the celebrations. Now, we know that Adonijah has went down here, if you look at the center bottom, at Ren en Gel. David sends, down, sends them down to Gihon. It's a spring. It's the main water source of Jerusalem, by the way. It's not very far from Jerusalem, as you can see, just down the hill, down here in the Kidron Valley. All right, so David's going to have the anointing here while the festival and celebration is going down on with Adonijah and his people down in Ragel, not very far away. In fact, they can hear each other, uh, especially when they start celebrating. So, all these acts David wants done now. He wants them to get down there without delay and getting Solomon anointed this would help save the throne. You couldn't let Adonijah stay there very long because then the people might assume that David just can't say anything or for some other reason approved Adonijah. Okay? So this is how close they are. Understand that because that comes into play in a moment. Verse 34. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. So this is the counter plan 
David tells him, this is how we're going to stop Adonijah, basically. They're going to anoint Solomon right away. Verse 35. You shall then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne. They're going to come back up to Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne, for he shall be king in my place. He's the new king. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. He's now going to be the active king over Israel. Verse 36, And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, remember he's there, he's one of the group, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord the king, say so. In other words, he's saying, Amen, it means so be it. I believe it. I'm confirming it. Then he asked the blessing of the Lord. Notice the, the God of my Lord, the king. That's David's God to bless this. Make it happen. That's what it's saying. Make it happen. Now, Benaiah continues to talk. Remember, they're still back with David uh, in his bedchamber discussing the plans. As the Lord has been with my Lord, the king. Remember, this is Benaiah speaking. As the Lord has been with my Lord the King, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. Now this is a way of Benaiah pledging his loyalty to the new king. Just like he was with David, now he's going to be a Solomon. Verse 38. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites, remember that's the special soldiers, and the Pelathites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. Now the people can see who David wants to be king. So when they would see this with Zadok and Nathan and the bodyguard with their leader there, they knew something was going to happen big. Verse 39, they go on down to Gihon. I just showed you that on the map. Then Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent. The tent would be where it was kept there in Jerusalem, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. Notice, all the people. That's the people of Israel the people of Jerusalem. This is the official announcement of David's replacement. Zadok anointed Solomon. They blow the trumpet. All the people joined in. Long live King Solomon. Solomon's the new king. So all that David had ordered happened. And all the people went up after him. We're in verse 40. And the people were playing pipes and rejoicing greatly so that the ground shook with the sound. So now, those celebrating the anointing of King Solomon are making so much noise. In fact, the Hebrew says, and the ground split open at the sound of them like it was an earthquake. So what they're saying, this is a way of exaggerating and making the point, this was really loud. It was like it was earth splitting, okay? And it emphasizes here the fact of the loudness. Plus, the celebration confirms that the people accept Solomon as their king. So now the noise gets down to where Adonijah is. And you can just understand easily how they'd wonder, where's all this noise coming from? I mean, they'd been down there with their festival and the people they had, but now they got this huge uproar up towards Jerusalem. So what happens? Adonijah and all the guests, we're in verse 31, who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. So they're winding down and David, excuse me, and Solomon and his followers are winding up. And when Solomon heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, what does this uproar in the city mean? So they moved back up to Jerusalem. That is, those with Solomon. 
while he was still speaking, this is interesting, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest came, and Adonijah said, come in, for you are a worthy man, and bring good news. So Adonijah must have thought that Jonathan was going to join up with, with him. After all, his father was with him, and he calls him, listen to what he says, come in, for you are a worthy man, and bring good news. A worthy man, and bring good news. He expected Adonijah to probably tell him what happened. Maybe all the people are celebrating that Adonijah was the new king. But that's not what it was. Now let me remind you, this is the Jonathan, the son of Abiathar the priest, who was with Adonijah now, but earlier had been part of that spy network, remember? Where Zadok and Abiathar would listen in on Absalom and his plans and then pass them on to Jonathan. And Jonathan would run them over to David, right? So Adonijah is called a worthy man. But listen to what he says after Adonijah says, you bring good news. Jonathan said to Adonijah, no, for our Lord King David has made Solomon king. So when he says, listen to this again, come in, for you are worthy, a worthy man and bring good news, Adonijah says, no, for our Lord King David, notice our Lord, he's still Lord of David. He's not loyal to Adonijah. He's just bringing that news over so Adonijah can hear. Plus, his father's there, right? He may have came over to warn his father to get away from Adonijah because Solomon's the new king and Adonijah's in trouble and those associated with him. Verse 44, he goes on. You know, now, Jonathan's describing to Adonijah what happened. And the king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelophites, the big group of bodyguard, and they had him ride on the king's mule. So, Jonathan is telling Adonijah, what has happened. Solomon is down there, has been down there with Zadok and Nathan and the bodyguard, Benaiah, plus he rode down there on the king's mule. Now listen what he tells Adonijah next. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon, and they have gone up from their rejoicing. They've gone back up to Jerusalem so that the city is in an uproar. Everyone is celebrating Solomon as a new king. This is the noise you have heard. See at the end of verse 45? This is the uproar you heard. It's not for you, Adonijah. Solomon's the new king. Verse 46, Solomon sets on the royal throne. He goes on to say, Moreover, the king's servants came to congratulate our Lord King David. So they went up to David saying, May your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours, and may his throne greater than your throne. So he gives him a play-by-play -play of what went on when David announced to that group of men that they approved. Last line, and the king bowed himself on the bed. Even David approved. He probably couldn't get out of bed anymore, so he bowed himself while he was there in the bed. Verse 48, and the king also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne. He's talking about David, what David said who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. So now they must have returned back to David and to his bedroom. 
And David responds when he hears the news that Solomon is the new king. Now, why would David say something like, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel? Let me tell you one reason. Because this is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That promise that God gave to David that he'd have a son and he would establish his kingdom forever. This is the beginning of that. So David's son to another son to another son. Now we're going on to grandsons, I should say. It went to David's son, Solomon, and then his grandson, and then his great-grandson. And we use the word great-grandson and grandson. They did in the ancient world. They just called it son again. So that gets a little confusing. So let's understand. David have a son who would sit on the throne of God for Israel. And we know it carries forward all the way to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is both the son of David and the son of God coming to the throne. So what David is responding to is the Davidic covenant is starting to be fulfilled. Now, once this is said, this is kind of funny, verse 49, then all the guests of Adonijah trembled and rose and each went his own way. <laughs> party over, festival over. It went from party to panic, from festival to fleeing. They went home and said, we're done here. Verse 50, and Adonijah feared Solomon. So he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Now what's he doing? Adonijah knows he's done for. And that Solomon has the authority now to have him executed for trying to take the throne. So Adonijah does about the only thing he could. He went to the altar seeking some sort of protection from God. It was common in the Near East that if you needed protection, you could go to the shrine and sometimes who was ever after you would honor that. But he was trying to keep himself from being killed. So he went to the altar and grabbed the horns. If you don't know it, there's some horns that come out on the corners of the altar. So he grabbed the horns like he's going to hold on for his life. He was afraid that Solomon would have him executed. But you see, Solomon is not like Adonijah. Solomon is gracious. The story continues. Then it was told Solomon, Behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon. For behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. In other words, Adonijah is saying, I'm going to hold on to these horns until King Solomon swears to me that he won't put me to death with the sword. So it looks like he's going to hold on to these horns no matter what. Until King Solomon swore he would not have him executed. Verse 52. And Solomon said, remember he's heard what Adonijah is doing, holding on those horns. And Solomon said, if he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So here's what Solomon does. If he starts showing himself worthy, that means he's not going to claim the throne again. He's not going to give Solomon any problems regarding the throne or that he has the right to be there. Okay. No conspiracies, no more plans to take the throne. Then he can live. But if he gets wicked and he starts to pull this kind of stuff again, he shall die. Note that Solomon is acting right now as a king. He is sharing David's kingship in this final period of David's life. Verse 53, So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. That is, talking about Adonijah. And he came and paid homage. He bowed and showed respect to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, go to your house. 
<laughs> Adonijah's done. He bowed to King Solomon, lucky to be alive, and Solomon sent him home. So that's the end of Adonijah and the problems he gives, any kind of problem he gives to Solomon. Now, we go on to chapter 2, where David's going to give some final words to Solomon, and they're great, okay? So we want to listen to this carefully. David's charge to Solomon. When I use the word charge, it's like, it's sort of a combination of orders and now here's your job. Here's what you're supposed to do. Chapter 2 of 1 Kings, verse 1. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying. So we have some more time here before David really dies. It may be anywhere from a year or two, we're not told. It may have been as short as a few months. We can't really tell for sure. We've already seen over in Chronicles where David prepared the temple and everything like that and told him there he's going to be king, all right? And it could be that Adonijah heard that and just ignored it. So in verses 2 through 4, David is going to give Solomon some instructions uh, on a spiritual life first, on a spiritual life. Then he's going to talk to him about what to do with some of the people in Israel that he's going to have to deal with. All right, verse 2. David's talking to Solomon. I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and be a man. So he says a couple of things here. Um, the way of the earth is that everyone dies. Okay. He tells Solomon, be strong and be a man, or show yourself to be a man. In other words, take responsibility for what you do. Do what you're supposed to do as the king. Be a leader. Be the king you're supposed to be. So after he announces he's about to die, he tells Solomon to show yourself to be a man. He continues, and keep the charge of the Lord... Your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his laws, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So he couldn't give his son any better advice. And what he says is, if you obey the Lord... That includes the law of Moses. That's the Mosaic Covenant. They were still under the Mosaic Covenant. That he would prosper in all he does. And that's what the Mosaic Covenant says. If you obey the Lord, you're blessed. If you don't, you're cursed. So he's saying, stay in line with the law of Moses. He couldn't give me better advice, you see. What happens if he does? Verse 4, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me. In other words, the, the Davidic covenant will be fulfilled. Which said, saying, if your son, if your sons, that's sons and grandsons and so on, pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their being, that's the word nephish, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, here's what this is saying. If Solomon did live an obedient life, he would continue to carry on the dynasty as king and be blessed. And this would continue on to his son and then his grandson and the descendants of David. All right? All the way through the line. David to Solomon to son, the next son, the next son, and so on. But at the same time, he needed to have, notice this, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their being. This is wholehearted devotion to God. We've talked about that. They would pass on the throne to their own son, 
so David would always have a son on the throne of Israel. Now listen to me, young people. There is no better advice than what we just read from a father to a son. And if you don't have a father, he's not there, he doesn't teach you, let me say to you, there's nothing better in this world or in your life to be obedient to God, to live a life of obedience. Now, we live under the new covenant, but the principle of obedience is different. We are to regularly confess our sins, like I remind you. We don't take animals to the altar, do we? We confess our sins. You must keep doing that habitually. When you sin, you confess it. And you know when you sin, you may feel guilty. You may realize, well, I shouldn't have done that. You confess your sin and let the Spirit of God control you and live obedient that way. Walk in faithfulness with all your heart, with all your being. All right? This is how we live a blessed life and honor God and see and receive great reward when we get to heaven. So now David has just given this advice to Solomon. Now it appears that he didn't give this kind of advice to his first sons, his earlier sons, so that when they grew up as adults, they got involved in rape and murder and trying to overthrow David. Two of them did, right? But now Solomon has advice. David set Solomon on course for him to become a man of God and the king of the nation, to be a real leader of the people of God. What a responsibility. But at the same time, what's wonderful about this, he has God on his side. And as long as he obeys God, he'll do great. And Solomon does do great. But again, he has some missteps too, just like David. Now remember also, David knew, even before his birth, that Solomon was going to be his successor. So he probably set aside time this time to say, I've really got to raise Solomon right. So he gave him special instruction, just like we see here. We saw over in Chronicles where he prepared the path for Solomon by having everything ready for the temple, organizing the Levites, the military, the administration, not to mention providing a massive amount of material and wealth for the building of the temple. So here we see David instructing Solomon on his spiritual life. Now, the second part of the instructions to Solomon has to do with some particular people in Israel. Verse 5. Moreover, you also know that Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me. What Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me. How he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel. Abner the son of Ner. Amasa the son of Jether. Remember he killed them. Murdered them. Whom he murdered and shed the blood of war in peacetime, and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. So what David is telling Solomon is that you're going to have to deal with Joab. Joab had been a mixed blessing with David. Even though he was fiercely loyal to David, there were times he did not carry out everything David wanted, like killing he mentions here Abner and Amasa. Remember, Amasa was appointed the general to replace Joab. And Joab, when he had the opportunity, he killed him. He murdered him. And the explanation here is that he, he murdered him 
and shed the blood of war is like he was at war, but he wasn't. They were at peace. So when he murdered him, when he killed him, it wasn't just killing like war. It was murder, but he acted like it was still war. And that's what this means. Whom he murdered and shed the blood of war in peacetime and putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of his feet. Now this means that when he murdered him, he splashed blood on him. It's like saying he spilt blood he shouldn't have. This was murder, and that's the point. So again, shedding the blood of war in peacetime. Notice the blood of war in peacetime shouldn't have been done. And putting the blood of war on the belt around his waist and on the sandals of the feet. This is another way of saying that he should not have killed those two. Joab was acting like he was still at war when they were actually at peace. And he dealt treacherously with these two generals, making their killings murder. Now, David did not deal with Joab. It may be, and it probably is, that he didn't know what to do with him. And this is another problem with David he had. He didn't deal with this powerful general who had done so much for him, but at the same time had did some killings which he shouldn't have. So he's going to pass him on to Solomon to deal with him. Verse 6, Do to him, therefore, according to your wisdom, and do not bring down his gray hair in peace to Sheol. So this is a way of saying Solomon, you cannot let Joab's murder or rebellion go unpunished. Now, listen carefully. Solomon is the king. Joab, Joab has a new start. David's not going to punish him. But Solomon could. Why? Most important thing here is because he just rebelled against him becoming king. So Solomon had a reason, not just the past murders, but recent, and he can respond to what Joab just did by punishing him. And David says, you use your wisdom on how you're hand handling him. So it also offended Solomon, that's the point, by trying to seize the throne. Now that's just Joab. You've got to deal with Joab. Second is actually a group. But deal loyally with the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table because they drew near to help me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. So if you remember, Barzillai was this old man who was wealthy who helped David when he fled Absalom. And, and David had went up to Bahanaim, remember that? While Absalom moved into Jerusalem. And while in Mahanaim, Barzillai and a couple of others came in and generously provided for David. And David told him, when he had escorted him back down to the Jordan, that, come with me and I'll take care of you. Barzillai said, no, I'm going to go back home, be buried where my fathers were. But would you take care of, in fact, at that time he said a servant, and he named him. Kiliam, I believe, if I remember the name pronounced rightly. But now it mentions his sons, that he's supposed to take care of his sons. In other words, David wants Solomon to keep the promise he made to Barzillai. This time, take care of whoever he needs help with. And this would be his sons in this case. All right, that's Barzillai, the sons of Barzillai. Now, the third is a person, and we remember him well, Shimei. This is a Shimei, the cursor rock thrower. Well, David wanted to make an adjustment on his penalty that he gave him. So let's read the verse. And there was also, also with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Baharim, who cursed me with grievous curse on that day, and I went to Mahanaim, 
But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. So let me remind you what happened. Remember when David was fleeing, he was out there throwing rocks and stones and said, this is what you get for killing people in Saul's line. Okay, and Abishai wanted to come down and kill him, and David stopped him. David just let him go and went on over to Manaheim. I say Manaheim. I always say it wrong. Mahanaim, okay? But when David came back to go to Jerusalem, here came Shimei again, saying kind of like, oh, I shouldn't have done that to you and everything. David said, okay, don't worry about it. You're pardoned. You're off the hook. But David's given that second thoughts and says, I shouldn't have let him off so easy. After all, he did curse the king. And he threw rocks at us. David may be thinking that maybe I should let Abishai kill him, but David didn't. In fact, now, when he comes back down and is actually asking David for forgiveness or, or some sort of mercy, David says, it's okay, you're, you're okay. But now David's saying, no, he needs to have his penalty adjusted. Okay, let's put it that way. So what he says in verse 9, Now therefore do not hold him guiltless. In other words, he's not guiltless. He is guilty. For you're a wise man. So he puts it in Solomon's, uh, uh, leaves it up to Solomon again. You're wise enough to handle him. You will know what you ought to do to him. And you shall bring his gray hair, head down with blood to show. In other words, he's going to be treated guilty for doing what he did in disrespecting the king. Now, the other thing about Shimei, and we've seen him, the way he manipulates things, is he's a potential troublemaker. So that's someone you got to deal with. All right, he's done talking to Solomon. Now we come to the end of our story, the death of David. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. It's hard to tell how long Solomon reigned with David. I had mentioned earlier, it's probably maybe two years. It's hard to say. But they did reign together. Let's put it this way. This is the way we understand these things. You have a king who's dying, basically. He's sick and dying. But you also have a new king who is active and, and ruling. They're still both kings, so they call that a co-regency. But Solomon's the one who's really doing the, the uh, ruling now and making the decisions. And that's what we see here. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father, throne of David his father and his kingdom was firmly established Solomon is in place and he's the next king well that ends our lesson and our series the life of David let's pray well Heavenly Father this has been a wonderful story to learn about King David and his life. There's so many lessons here for us. Thank you that we have your word on this, this life of David. Challenge us with the many things that we've heard and learned that we might be obedient like David charged Solomon and live a life of obedience and seek you with all our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.